Hello and um, welcome to this talk in the context of the uh, Link Live Talks. Uh, I am Emmanuel Roux. I work as a neurointerventional radiologist at the Leahy Hospital and Medical Center in Burlington in the United States. Um, and I'm an associate professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. Um, I wanted to welcome you to this uh, first uh, um, ever Link Live Talks. I'm very honored to be participating. So thanks for um, thanks to everyone for allowing me to uh, present uh, um, our multi-center experience on the long-term results for the treatment of intracranial aneurysms with the uh, surpassable flow diverter. These are my disclosures. So first let's introduce quickly the device uh, which i'm sure uh, a lot of people know because it's becoming widely used so essentially the surpass evolve is uh, the new generation of the surpass flow diverting implants uh, and compared to its uh, predecessor the original surpass streamline um, it has fewer and thinner wires um, by changing though the geometry of the braid angles, which in this case in the surface evolved uh, are increased compared uh, to those of the surface streamline, um, engineers achieved the, the goal to maintain the same uh, stability of pore density with 15 to 30 pores per uh, millimeter square, which eventually gives the flow diverting effect. Um, fewer and thinner wires also means a smaller profile of the device, which is now deliverable to an O27 microcutter um, uh, compared to the streamline, which required a larger uh, and dedicated delivery system. Also, uh, by um, keeping some engineering features stable, which we will see later, uh, it was achieved to maintain the biomechanical stability of the, of the streamline. So this is a quick uh, overview. Uh, so surpass comes uh, from 2.5 millimeters to five and goes from 48 to 64 wires. Majority have 64 wires. So there is a significant decrease in wires compared to the uh, streamline, which uh, uh, for five millimeter was to 96. Um, but with the, the surpass evolve has a 25 to 30% higher braid angle. The, 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 uh, the shape of the um, braids uh, changes. Uh, the wires are thinner, 13%, uh, and uh, the, the, despite of a decreased mesh density, as you can see here, the pore density is maintained. The visibility is the same because of the um, same number of visible wires. So the geometry, which is what matters, is this. The surface streamline had a square pore size, whhereas the Evolve has a rhomboid pore size. This, despite again the thinner and the fewer braids, allows for stable pore density. In blue, the streamline, in yellow, they evolve, which is very stable compared to other um, available devices that have more variation in the range of porosities of their implants. So all the biomechanical uh, features of the streamline uh, are uh, kept in the evolve. Now, uh, when you look at computational flow dynamics studies, you actually have uh, the proof um, um, of what I said. So you see how um, the velocity magnitude decreases um, when you put a streamline or an evolve in a model aneurysm in a, in a comparable way, which is, again, not unexpected because we know that the porosity is the main determinant of the flow diverting effect. Now, in terms of radial force, if we factor in a 3D chart all the um, features that um, determine the radial force of an implant, and here there are all the uh, commercially most of the commercially available implants between the US and Europe, you see that increasing braid angle, increasing material strength, and increasing the number of wires equals highest radial force. Now, it's no surprise that the surpass streamline has an increased radial, uh, has the highest radial force, but this comes at the cost, obviously, of a more complex delivery system. The evolve by increasing the braid angle, 
keeping the same material strength. The, the material is just slightly less strong because of the thinner wires and the keeping a high number of wire um, achieved uh, um, good radial force similar to that of the surface and higher than other devices uh, by um, increasing the, uh, by having an increased deliverability and, uh, and the easiness of use of the stent. So now that we have introduced the device, let's um, speak about the study um, whose results I'm gonna discuss. So this is a study that involves uh, patients from four institutions in three continents uh, and in four countries. It's a prospectively maintained database, which we started um, um, with the first two participants being Toronto and the Gold Coast University Hospital at the time of the very first uh, implants of the, of, the, of the Evolve, which was uh, April 2019. And then to our study, we added immediately after University Hospital Birmingham and the Leahy Hospital and Medical Center, where I'm currently at. Um, we, uh, a wide array, uh, array of aneurysms was uh, treated with, uh, with, uh, with this implant, wide neck essentially, uh, in the anterior and the posterior circulation. Um, patients were treated uh, either uh, if they had been treated in the past or not, and uh, some um, uh, acutely um, ruptured patients were included. So this, I like this database because I think it represents sort of a real world scenario, a little bit more free than um, what you see in strictly um, uh, regulated trials because this is more of a, a real world because uh, although practice changes uh, between hospitals, uh, so there are variations, but all of our patients are strictly put on dual antiplatelet therapy for at least six months. Uh, the neurological evaluation that were done as discharge and a clinic visit. Um, the imaging follow-up was done again with a variety of modalities according to institutional policies. Um, and the, for the purpose of this analysis, we divided the complications in early and delayed. So within or after 13 days from the procedure and in minor or major, depending if they um, persisted after the acute uh, presentation or, or, or not. So all the interventions were performed between April 2019 and March 2021. Uh, obviously more patients are done after, but for the purpose of this follow-up, they are obviously not included. Um, and uh, all included, we have 84 patients. The vast majority is female as expected of middle age, 56 years. 93 aneurysms were treated. Multiple uh, patients had adjacent aneurysms. Um, one aneurysm was uh, treated twice, was giant, giant cavernous aneurysm with partial thrombosis. And uh, not unexpectedly, the majority of these aneurysms uh, were uh, in the supraclinal internal choroid artery. A fair amount was uh, 13 was in the cavernous internal choroid artery. And uh, um, a smaller amount was in the posterior circulation. And uh, about um, um, six aneurysms were in in uh, in more in, in branches distal to the to the ICA. So the average size, though we had the representation of small, large, and giant aneurysms, uh, was uh, small, so less than twelve millimeters. Though on the sort of bigger side of of this category, um, um, the majority again was sixty seven were small aneurysms. Um, one. Uh, was a blood blister ruptured, complex aneurysm. Uh, the majority, 50%, uh, 50 aneurysms were asymptomatic, 34 were symptomatic. Um, 16 had previous subarachnoid hemorrhage and they received previous treatment. Um, and um, um, 13 had ocular neuropathy and uh, five showed ischemic symptoms. Um, 22 aneurysm had been previously treated, some uh, with coiling, some with more complex calling of calling plus flow diversion, four uh, received a web, and one uh, got treated with um, two other flow diverters before. In terms of technique, again, this um, the 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 approaches 
changed, but um, the materials and all that. But um, all the operators um, use the tray axle approach in, um, in, in all cases. Um, mostly were done femoral, some were done radial. We have also done some radial cases here uh, at the Lehi Clinic. Um, with the new dedicated radial catheters, um, we can go directly very high, uh, as high as an intermediate catheter. For, for example, here, sometimes we treat aneurysms going directly, I don't know, with a vector uh, intermediate catheter and using it uh, both as a guide and as an intermediate, and we bring it very high or in other cases, we use the CAT5. But in general, you want your either your guide or intermediate catheter very high or to use a triaxial approach because control in flow diversion uh, is everything. Support is everything. So uh, the tower of power is extremely important here. So essentially, the average was 1.1 implants per patient. So the vast majority of patients were treated with only one implant. Uh, and all implants were successfully deployed. Um, no implant had to be discarded, uh, especially early in the experience. Um, three uh, implants migrated, um, um, i.e. either went more distal or came more proximal. This um, was probably due uh, because obviously there is a learning curve to not uh, um, um, ideal length usually of the device, usually longer is more stable. Uh, but again, there is there was a learning curve with this uh, device that nobody had um, you know used before. So these cases were corrected by um, using another implant. Um, then there was um, one stent that uh, uh, ribboned and required complete resheating and repositioning. Usually the ribboning uh, can be dealt with with manipulation of the device, but in this case, it had to be completely resheated and repositioned. And one stent kinked during microcatheter traversing. So when traversing the microcatheter, uh, sorry, um, the, the implant to the microcatheter to massage and oppose it to the wall, um, and the stent, uh, uh, the stent kinked uh, uh, on the vessel wall. So um, side branches, again, most of the aneurysms were uh, in the supraclinal ICA, so it's not surprising that most branches, uh, most cases had the uh, side branches covered 80%. Um, again, following thing that I'm gonna say, changes from institution to institution, resheating and adjustments were performed in 35% cases. Uh, ballooning for wall opposition was performed in roughly 30% of cases. For example, here at Leahy, uh, we like to balloon all stands. Other operators don't like and do it on um, as as needed basis. These are really uh, for the these are really you know operator preferences unless there is an obvious clearly malposition. Um, additional devices or uh, or adjunctive materials were required in sixteen cases rather than uh, in three cases. Uh, a neuroform atlas was required to pin the um, the um, implant to the vessel, the evolve, and in 13 cases, adjunctive coilings were used. So in many institutions, um, um, including ours, uh, in, for very large aneurysms, uh, the operators prefer to put coils in addition to the flow diverted to avoid um, you know, delayed ruptures, which we know with large and giant aneurysms can happen due to the well digest and during thrombosis from, from flow diversion. And there were no intra-procedural complications. So no ruptures, um, no dissections. So uh, the safety profile, of course, we have some of the best operators, but the safety profile intra-procedural device was uh, very satisfying. In terms of efficacy, which is one of the things obviously that matters the most, uh, we have a a uh, quite long follow-up with a minimum of six months to a maximum of one year and a half, um, with a medium of eight months. So, so 72 aneurysms have uh, follow-up in this range. So 79% showed complete occlusion and 18% showed partial occlusion. Uh, as I said, we have some very large aneurysms included. So these uh, can take longer. Uh, what is uh, um, interesting, but not unexpected because we know uh, these are uh, more or less the numbers for this class of aneurysms. We have 80% of small, 83% of small aneurysms were occluded at six months. So this is uh, comparable 
to or, or, or slightly better to what we have in the existing literature. Um, the case of giant cavernous aneurysms that required retreatment um, uh, obviously is a different uh, uh, story and um, we will have to see and follow up how it does. Uh, sometimes these aneurysms require uh, more aggressive treatments with um, vessel takedown. So we will see what happens with that. Safety, obviously, um, the perhaps uh, equally important as efficacy. Um, we found a very good safety profile of the device with uh, uh, early neurological complications. So happening in the first month, 4.8% uh, were transient minor. We had uh, three TAAs, obviously all resolved, and one isolated uh, episode of blurred vision, uh, which resolved uh, um, spontaneously. So of these four transient or minor complications, uh, none uh, persisted. In one case, there was standard thrombolism day four, one of the early cases, there was no obvious explanation for this. Uh, um, it, uh, the stent was well deployed. The, um, the, the, the patient had been prepared uh, with dual antiplatelets. Uh, and uh, so this is probably due to some underlying unknown condition at the time or perhaps medication non-compliance. We, we did not have an explanation for this. Uh, the patient didn't do well. But uh, again, this was an isolated case and for which there was no very clear explanation. We did not find delayed complications, nothing after uh, the very, very early stages of the implantation, and there were no deaths. Um, Non-device related complications, like sort of pathology slash intervention, but not strictly device related complications, where one contrast induced encephalopathy, uh, we see that sometimes with repeated uh, injections in one territory, particularly if the patient had a subarachnoid hemorrhage before. There was one cavernous sinus syndrome in the aneurysm I had mentioned before, and uh, um, cranial nerve paresis worsening. And one patient had a posterior fossa hemorrhage, um, but it was a patient that had been treated multiple times for a blister aneurysm. And then non-neurologic adverse events like allergic crash and femoral artery pseudoaneurysms. Um, um, there was the stent occlusion that I um, discussed before and one asymptomatic, which was found at follow-up. So only one stent occlusion was symptomatic. Intimal hyperplasia of some degree was seen in 20% of patients, but only in one. This required the PTA and stenting. So only one flow limiting intimal hyperplasia was seen. What most operators do in these cases of intimal hyperplasia, they keep dual antiplatelets up to one year, and at the subsequent follow-up, they evaluate it to continue or remove. Um, the 5%, uh, uh, three of the covered PCOMs were occluded, but they were asymptomatic. In two cases, there were hemodynamic changes in the circle of wheelies for A1 coverage. In one case, this was wanted because it was a small, Mm, very small aneurysm of the A1 sidewall that was uncoilable. So we put a flow diverter, it was actually the case here at Leahy, from the NCA to the ICA, the A1 was covered. It actually regressed uh, uh, and closed as we wanted. And it was taken over by the contralateral ICA through the anterior communicating artery complex, which was very robust. So I will now show a few cases. A 44 year old with a five millimeter per ophthalmic aneurysm. Here you can see the ophthalmic artery, the device, long device, these uh, tend to oppose very well to the vessel wall. Um, and uh, here you see the aneurysm at preoperative CTA. Uh, at six month follow up, the aneurysm is completely closed and the ophthalmic artery is patent. This was an example of a long construct, um, a five by 20. Here we have the example of a short construct with a paraphthalmic aneurysm here. Here, the stent is completely open while opposed, and at six months, the aneurysm is gone. We know that these aneurysms don't come back. Uh, this is a cavernous aneurysm we treated at Lehi, uh, quite large and symptomatic. There was a position only on one wall in the largest portion of the aneurysm, and at seven months, the vessel is completely reconstructed, so even without complete vessel wall, uh, the flow diverting effect worked very well. Uh, and this is a partially thrombosed symptomatic cavernous aneurysm. Again, we treated here. Um, this was a, a transradial case, so we brought the radial catheter, the vector actually up to here, and then we deployed the stent over this segment and down to the petrus. and at seven months, the aneurysm was completely gone. 
uh, this again was a long construct. We tried to prefer those. In conclusion, uh, with this new implant, we have seen in our cohort, uh, uh, prospectively maintained cohort, uh, roughly 80% complete occlusion at a follow-up time of six to 18 months uh, with an average of one implant. We had no device failures, no device had to be uh, removed. Um, um, we had 1.2% major complications, again, an unexplained one, and about 5% minor or um, and early neurological complications, which all resolved spontaneously. Uh, there were no delayed neurological complications, no symptomatic side branch occlusions, and uh, no deaths. Uh, we will keep uh, this database. Uh, we will prepare this data that I showed today uh, with a few changes for, uh, with a few uh, additions for uh, an upcoming uh, publication. And of course, there is the ongoing SERPAS Evolve uh, a trial which uh, which uh, will be completed in in a couple of years for which uh, several patients have already been enrolled which will obviously get the most uh, standardized data on the device so with this i thank the audience for your attention and also obviously on behalf of my uh, colleagues from all these institutions and um, thanks again for inviting to talk to this very exciting uh, first iteration of this event thank you very much Everyone, have a great day.